If you could please silence your cell phones, that would be wonderful. Thank you. And I think we're almost right on time. So if everybody is comfortable and ready to start, I'll dive in. Well, welcome. Thank you all um, to the t annual public meeting for C10 2022 in person. I say finally, this is my first meeting. <laughs> it's in person. So 100% of my meetings have been in person. But for you guys, I'm sure that's great. You're probably zoomed out a little bit. Um, but for some folks, we are offering this online. So they might be watching uh, YouTube, our live stream, or they might be checking this out uh, later. So we had some handouts if you wanted to take one. If you don't, they're back there. You can sort of follow along. Um, we have a great docket planned. Um, we're going to start with the official business of nominating and electing our officers um, for our board of directors. So I think with that, um, can we have all of the officers stand, please? So we have Pat Skibby, our president, Karen Claggett, our clerk. Jared's already standing. Great, my <laughs> treasurer. <laughs> And Carrie Boyd, our uh, vice president. So I move for all of you to maintain your roles. I nominate each of you. Um, do I hear a second? I think everybody seconds. <laughs> and uh, I think we, I call for a vote. All in favor? Say aye. Okay, seems like unanimous. Everybody's <laughs> on board for another year. Thank you. I missed my gavel. Well, I'm overjoyed to be here as the executive director. Um, I've been in this seat for about two weeks. So it's been, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been a trial by fire, but I have enjoyed it greatly and uh, many years ahead, I hope. And I can't thank enough our outgoing director, Natalie Piltreats. <laughs> preceded by Sandy Gavitis. So I, what's the term? I, I stand on the shoulders of giants, so I hope that I can do my best to uh, keep the tradition of great leadership for the organization. Um, so you'll see the agenda. We have some great things in store. Um, I'm going to start off with a little bit of an introduction of myself and uh, also um, some things that brought me to C10. Uh, so I am um, formerly from the southern New Hampshire region. I grew up in Derry, but now I live in Stratum, and I think everybody here knows that's one of the towns in the EPZ, the 10-mile radius of the Seabrook plant, and um, I actually didn't really tune into the fact that there was a lot of considerations for living that close to a plant. I knew Seabrook was here. Um, I grew up going to Hampton Beach, and it's just something you saw when you drove in. You're like, oh, that's that weird power plant. I don't think I even tuned in, you know, that it was nuclear, um, and so that's one thing that made me think Growing up here, going to high school here, I didn't hear anything about it. Uh, wouldn't it be great if we had some type of curriculum or some type of uh, requirement that kids have to learn about what's in their backyard so parents know what's in their backyard? So that's one of the things that I've really um, kind of put a sticky note in my mind, future years endeavors, um, something that we're going to work on. I know that Karen and I are really excited about some, some initiatives that we might take. Uh, reasons why I love C10. I actually had to write a research project, a research paper, on a local organization that was doing something environmental related. And I looked at quite a few, um, but I decided on C10 and I was blown away by the website and the, the blog posts and really the advocacy work, the legal challenge on the ASR concrete issue. I was blown away. I thought this must be an organization with 50 people. Like, there's, this must be a, a, like a million dollar funded organization. Like, I was so impressed. There's a monitoring network that has, you know, 30 years of data on radiation. I was, I was so impressed. Uh, and even more impressed when I learned that it's two staff members. I mean, <laughs> that's really incredible. And only recently have they bumped up to, you know, be working as much as they are. So that just goes to show the dedication of the staff members, but also the board members and the advisory board members, um, grassroots, community, I mean, that's what's going to help us stay abreast of what's happening at the plant 
and um, really get people motivated on this issue. Um, so planning for a strong future, um, what does that look like? Uh, bringing in young people, getting them excited about this issue, I think that we have great opportunity. I see young people really motivated about uh, climate change in particular, um, but I think that it's a, it's a parallel. It's all you know, the same umbrella of environmental health, not just for the intrinsic environmental factors, um, you know, maintaining the beauty uh, of nature and, and the health of animals, but our public health, our children's health. Um, I think that that's a really strong message, and I think that young people are, are ready to hear it. Um, and so I'm excited to take on some, some new initiatives and, and do some things to try to um, bring in some, some young, fresh voices. Uh, so for those of you who are attending via YouTube, we're going to have a question and answer session at the end. And so if you want to just type your questions, we'll try to uh, get to them after we take care of the in-person questions. So who's next on my agenda? So now that I've talked about kind of how I got here and how, where I think we might go in the future years, um, I think it's important at our annual meeting, and from what I can tell, what we usually do, uh, is look at a year in review and the successes. And let's not forget that we were challenged with COVID for multiple years and still had astounding accomplishments um, and had a lot of uh, Zooms, like I said, but still had outreach events, still um, got projects off the ground with unprecedented amounts of, of grant funding. So um, looking at just this past year, we've added two new monitoring stations to New Hampshire. So when you look at the zone, the 10 mile emergency planning zone, you see how much of New Hampshire is in there and how much of Massachusetts is in there. And historically, we've had tremendous support from the Massachusetts Department of Health and from Massachusetts residents who care about this issue. Most people in this room are probably from Massachusetts. Um, and New Hampshire, um, now we're up to six stations in New Hampshire and 12 in Massachusetts for 18 stations, which I think is incredible. Um, but more work still to be done to really get New Hampshire on board, not just with the monitoring, but with um, funding, you know, trying to help support our activities because even though it's really Massachusetts that's been supporting us for so long, I as a New Hampshire resident have been benefiting just as much. Um, and so really getting that message out to New Hampshire residents, um, especially folks who like to um, give philanthropically, I think is something that we've been doing and that I'll try to continue to do um, really strongly as well. Uh, so we upgraded our whole network to eBox computers. So we were on sort of, yeah, that's Mike Manser, our network administrator who took that on. We have a wonderful partner, Dan Seif, from Medcom International, um, and he's been a great partner. Um, and we had you know, gotten really creative over the years to make sure that we had a monitoring network, and um, he really brought us uh, into the 21st century and uh, made a nice homogeneous network with reliable technology, um, and we're taking steps to make it even better, in particular with climate resilience, so climate change is happening, is going to continue to happen, and we can expect that we will have more severe storms. We will have uh, periods of power outages. And aside from the obvious challenges that that brings people in their everyday life, think about the plant. Think about the radiation. Think about our monitoring network. Um, and so we've had a great team, Natalie and Mike, that really um, you know, went out and hit, hit the ground and put together some plans and secured unprecedented funding, like I said. Um, and so we have uh, in the works uh, a plan to get our monitoring network climate resilient. That's both power resilience and connectivity resilience with a wireless solution that's not going to be um, compromised by flooding. Um, I don't want to say tornadoes, but we've had a few in the past few years. Uh, earthquakes, hurricanes, wind. Um, so we're really trying to uh, be proactive instead of reactive. And I think that's uh, the position that we're going to take with, with all of our work. Uh, we've also maintained connections with the community. Like I said, outreach events, we've even you know, maintained that virtually in, in the COVID era, which was amazing. Um, not just with community members, but also other businesses, chambers of commerce, trying to make sure that we keep our business relationships uh, you know, really sound. Our, our financial well-being is really important so that we can continue to do the work that we do. Uh, we've maintained a very active blog. Like I said, one of the things I brought, that, that brought me here was the blogs, which I can thank Natalie for, but I know some others, Pat Skibby, uh, you know, have, have done some content on there. 
I'm just really information focused, public safety focused, you know, not um, a place where I can go for reliable information. And I really appreciated uh, that position that C10 took. Uh, our social media has, has grown tremendously with a number of followers, which is an indication of the number of people that are aware of the issue and are aware of the information that we're trying to present to them about their community. Um, and communication with legislators and federal regulators. We have great relationships with our legislators, uh, trying to, again, get a bigger foothold in New Hampshire. You know, I'm going to be uh, out there, uh, maybe the reverse, I'll knock on their doors. You know how they knock on our doors during campaign season? Maybe I just need to knock on theirs, so, you know, get, get this issue uh, front and center in New Hampshire. Um, we, uh, you'll hear later from um, some of our board members when they're presenting about some of the federal regulators that we spoke with and some of the work that we've done. Um, so if I go to somebody who has more fire in her belly than uh, I, I've seen in a, in a lot of folks, but in this room, um, lots of staunch advocates, but we are so uh, grateful for Diane Turco who's come to be our guest speaker today, and she's going to talk about some of the work that she does for uh, Keep Down Wonders. Diane. Thank you, Sarah. And it's so nice to see a lot of uh, faces that I know. Natalie, we've worked together on legislation. And your mom is here, and I worked with her on legislation in the 80s. Yes, I saw your name tag, yes. Yeah, yeah, thank you, yeah. Um, and congratulations to CTM for all the great work you're doing. The work on ASR was phenomenal, and we on the, um, on the Cape uh, were so impressed with it. So I have to apologize before I start because I don't have good news. <laughs> so anyways, I'm gonna talk about um, our decommissioning and um, how that's going, and I'm gonna keep my watch turned. Um, but Pilgrim shut down, well, a little bit about me. I live on Cape Cod in Harwich. Um, I've been a special education teacher uh, with children with intensive special needs for 30 plus years. But after Fukushima, I could not do that any longer. And I retired early to work full time as a volunteer on, on this issue. So it's, a, it's a, a deeply ingrained in my, um, my work. But I just want to know too, as I started in the mid 80s and I've been talking to some other people, how many started when Helen called, they heard Helen call the cut speak. Yeah, 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 that's our team, okay. Well anyways, Pilgrim shut down, as you know, in 2019, it was the worst operating reactor in the, in the United States. And I thought, yay, now I can finally retire and play with my grandchildren. And I went to two meetings um, as they were um, working on the license transfer to Holtec, and I was appalled at the lack of public input in communication with the whole process. As you know, Attorney General Maura Healy filed a petition to intervene to have public hearings before the license transfer. So didn't our, our staunch um, you know, heroes, uh, Mary Lambert and um, James Lambert also filed a petition and the NRC gave Holtec permission license transfer and it was done, it was a done deal. So they went to court and um, uh, Attorney General Healy got some concessions, but not a lot. She got some, but we really needed more. And so that's kind of our warning to all you folks. I saw that Seabrook's re-licensed until 2050. Are you kidding me? We all know it's gonna shut down before then, so you have to be prepared uh, for the license transfer and decommissioning now, because there's a lot of lessons that we've learned that has happened in New York and Vermont and Massachusetts, and you guys can really benefit from the information that we have. Um, so that's one thing. And as you know, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is trying to codify new rules that would actually codify everything the nuclear industry wants. So that's a big fight too. Um, so what we're doing is we are working on the light, um, legislation would be helpful for you to prepare. You could use legislation as a bargaining chip or actually you know, improve health and safety for the public. Um, in Massachusetts right now, there is a um, bill 2725, it's radiation monitoring on all the canisters on the site. And that's really important because we have monitors in Duxbury and Plymouth, but it's the canisters that you look at when you're looking at decommissioning and the leaking because there is no plan to repair them and there is no plan to stop any kind of disaster. 
We asked Holtec, what would you do if there was a leak in one of your cans, they're cheap cans. They, they're half inch steel that holds 68 highly radioactive rods. And it's surrounded by concrete that's not reinforced with anything. It's just shielding from radiation. So Holtec said, well, we have another larger canister like a Russian doll we'll put it on top. Um, that isn't an effective way to stop a leak because it needs to cool. And then we said, well, where's that, where's that big cask? It's in Camden, New Jersey at their factory. It would take a barge to bring it to Plymouth. And secondly, we said, um, so is this approved by the NRC? And they said no. So that's the stage of public safety when it comes to the dry casks. Um, also, um, our Senator Moran, uh, state senator, uh, filed a bill no dumping radioactive water in Cape Cod Bay. You'd think that would go. It's an emergency bill. It's stalled in the public health. It has not gone anywhere yet. Yeah, that's true. And then there's another bill that we filed, Cape Town Winters filed. Our legislators would not file it. It calls for a 50-mile emergency planning zone around every operating nuclear plant and every shut plant because of Seabrook will be a nuclear waste dump, and that waste is going nowhere for a very long time. So this bill would make um, all operating reactors, and it would cover your area 50 miles until the waste leaves the site. And so they have to pay attention to the public safety and health issues of a decommissioned reactor with the nuclear waste on site. Um, and then we have, um, so right now, currently, there are three laws in Massachusetts that already say they can't dump, and yet Holgate Tech still has it on their plan. It's a crime to deposit any waste into the ocean or the bay. Holtec would be liable for any damages that happens. And then we have an ocean sanctuary with the, great, the, what, um, the right whale, the endangered species. You can't dump into Cape Cod Bay, but Holtec still has that plan in place. There's also another. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission also has a, um, has a regulation that would impose restrictions on radiation releases in unrestricted areas, and that's our bays. So we have filed with the NRC to enforce that um, regulation for no dumping. We haven't heard back from them yet. Um, so I would recommend that you, um, you go to our website, and Pilgrim Watch's website, first of all. Pilgrim Watch has done a great job with the legal issues. And so this is all on their website, just Google Pilgrim Watch, and they've done a seven-page great summary of those issues. <clears throat> and so then, well, Holtec told Representative Keating that they were going to discharge a million gallons of radioactive water into Cape Cod Bay. And we're like, what? Are you kidding me? <clears throat> so um, we decided we were going to have a speak out, and that's what we do. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> <clears throat> so, Representative Keating told us all that. So Holtec came out and said, <clears throat> we're not going to dump. We'll, we'll, we won't dump. Well, we didn't believe them like you believe the NRC. Can I say that? <laughs> we don't believe the NRC and we don't believe Holtec either. So we had a speak out at the Plymouth Town Hall. And when we did that, we got in touch with everyone. In the, I've never seen a coalition like this before. We have the Wampanoag Herring Pond. Wampanoag with us. We have the Massachusetts um, Fishermen's Collaborative. We have the Lobstermen's Association. We have the League of Women Voters. It's a coalition of everyone and their mother has come together to stand up and say, halt, halt, tech. It's, it's a phenomenal. So we have been, we had a speak out. We had Senator Markey, um, Senator Warren, Representative Keeney. Everyone is saying, don't dump. And Holtec still has that on their plan. Just, um, I think it was last week, Rep uh, Attorney General Maura Healy also said no dumping. There can be no dumping in the Bay, and it's still on their plan. It's really outrageous. So we took the initiative of putting together a non-binding public advisory question. This is easy in Massachusetts. On your municipal elections, during your municipal elections, you can get 10 signatures on a non-binding public advisory question and get it on your ballot. That's all it takes for each town. It's so easy. So we did this in every town on the Cape, except Barnstable has a town council, and on Martha's Vineyard. And, and as of today, every town from Situate along the whole coast, all of Cape Cod and Martha's Vineyard have voted no dumping in our bay. And we presented that to Holtec to say, yeah, isn't that cool? So we presented it to Holtec and said, you know, there are our CEO, um, Chris Singh, said, we will listen to the stakeholders. And we said, the stakeholders have spoken. No dumping 
take it off your plan. They still haven't. So it's still a continuation of work, but we're not going to stop. One note is that Holtec has just said now they have a fourth option on the table to contain the water. So we see that as a little step in their, their way of saying we're not going to dump, but they haven't come out with that yet. Um, so, I, you know, Natalie, um, Sarah, like you, I stand on the shoulders of giants like Natalie and like Sandra and Debbie, who I haven't met, but she's done great work, and Mary Lambert and Dr. Helen Caldicott, all these women I've learned so much from, and I admire their, their perseverance and their, their work. So I want to thank them for all they've done, too. So, thank you. Thank you, Diane. We are very wise to listen to um, the warnings and the experience uh, because, you know, that's our future. Um, and Mary Lambert sent me a very uh, nice message with a lot of links to a lot of what you talked about. So uh, we'll be diving into that and taking you know, your, your wisdom and, and trying to do our best to prepare ourselves for our future. And um, next on our docket, go back to my agenda is C10's new research team, and our board president, Pat Skibby, will be filling us in on their activities. Thanks, Sarah. It's interesting because Diane talked about things that are out front, like speak out, and things that are very visible, and I'm gonna talk about things that are not visible at all, like the things that happen behind the scenes. So lots less human interest <laughs> in this particular case. And I keep thinking that the research team is a new entity, but it turns out the research team has been in practice, although obviously I wasn't part of it, since 2016. But I think it's become more active, and we certainly have a larger membership and a more formalized, um, structured approach now. <clears throat> so about the time that our whole organization became more structured, thanks to Natalie Hiltreet, when she became our new executive director. Diane Teed, who's been with C10 since the beginning, headed the group, headed the research team. And then as of about two years ago, the research team expanded to its current membership, the aforementioned Debbie, who is either in California or about to go to California to babysit her grandchildren, who's not here, me, Sarah Dunmans, who's also not here, because she lives about three hours away, Chris Nord, Tom Zabo, Jared Hubbard, and as point person, Diane Teed. And I'm sorry to have to announce that Diane Teed is resigning due to family considerations. She leaves behind giant shoes, and in fact, it's a little bit of a mystery to me how we're gonna fill those, but we're gonna try. We're aided also by two outstanding advisors, David Lockbaum, a national expert in nuclear power safety, and Dr. Victor Salma, an internationally recognized expert in ASR from the University of Colorado at Boulder. The research team's role is to examine and react to each of the many reports issued by the NRC in relation to Seabrook Nuclear Power Plant. The quarterly inspection reports, the annual assessment letters, the annual reactive reactor oversight process, effectiveness reports, and the annual state of the plant public meeting held every May in Hampton, New Hampshire. There are other reports, but frankly, the list is too long to even go on, but you get the idea. Further, the research team formulates questions about specific meetings. For example, this year we were fortunate to attend Microsoft Teams meetings with Christopher Hansen, the NRC chair, and with the Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards, a meeting that was called specifically for the ACRS, a subcommittee of the NRC, to learn from the resident inspectors at Seabrook about the status of ASR at the plant. The work of the RT, of course, involves reading the reports, researching any teams and processes with which we are unfamiliar, and then preparing written responses, normally in the form of questions. Our two current top issues are first, relentless insistence, the relentless is Diane Teed's word, I like that, relentless insistence on a valid assessment of the state of ASR at the plant, including the speed of its progression, accurate description of the damage to date, 
and a science-based projection of its future effects. And second, working to obtain information on the physical remediation work now happening at the plant as they try to address at least 43 specific areas of serious ASR damage that have occurred at parts of the plant. Those parts of the plant are now operating what is called, quote, out of design basis, unquote, due to ASR damage. In other words, those sections of the plant are no longer conforming to the original license. Our understanding is that there are through bolts and corner braces being installed at various locations, but we have no disclosure of an overall plan, a timeline, and how the success or the lack of the success will be assessed. And let me mention here that Tom Zabo, a recent addition to the RT team, at the meeting where the through bolts were mentioned, brought up the fact that if you're putting through bolts in a damaged concrete wall, the wall's already damaged, and then you're putting bolts through it. It doesn't really seem logical. As you might guess, there's not a lot of human interest in this reading and research. We are extremely fortunate to have deeply dedicated members on our research team who, amazingly to me, seem to find it fascinating. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Uh, really exciting work, and I think you guys are adding new things to your list every day. Flurries of emails of new things being added to, you, to your list every day. It's incredible. Uh, and we're, we're very grateful and lucky to have such a good, dedicated team. Um, next, uh, for even more detail um, on the updates of Seabrook Station, the degrading concrete, and more, we have board member Chris Nord. Uh, I was wondering if there was more water. I'm going to crack one open right now. So we celebrated, C10 celebrated its so-called 30th anniversary a year ago. And, um, and I've been thinking about birthdays and anniversaries a bit because, because I was born 70 years ago this year. So my birthday's coming right up. However, I think it's uh, very important that we recognize a 70th anniversary for the nuclear industry because 70 years ago this summer, the federal government called upon members of, of uh, chemical corporations and major utilities to convene so that they could be convinced by the federal government to enter a cogeneration scheme uh, with the federal government. And, and that would be that the commercial uh, industry would uh, come together to create nuclear power stations, atomic power plants around the country, uh, in order to provide uh, fissionable material that the federal government could then take away and use to develop its hydrogen bomb, hydrogen bomb project in the 1950s. And the byproduct of that fission process, which was heat, would be allowed to be used. The federal government was granting permission to these major corporations uh, to, they could use this, the heat generated at these reactors to produce electricity. This took place in the summer of 1952, the same time I was born. <clears throat> so it's very interesting to me because I've been chasing this issue my entire adult life. <clears throat> but uh, that what I'm talking about, this event that happened, was documented in a magazine called Reactor Science and Technology in October of 1952. So you can actually go into an archive if you want to look it up and see that what I'm saying is, is actually true. I just think it's an important uh, anniversary for us to, to make note of because we've been, many of us have been working on this issue for a long time and it was not something that the American public ever really wanted. They certainly wouldn't have wanted it if they'd known the, the, the buried half of the equation. So today we have uh, people everywhere that know that atomic uh, power is dangerous. Uh, and so, of course, 
those of us here on the seacoast, we want the waste that is generated from these plants to go somewhere else, to be not where our children and our families are. <clears throat> and in fact, the uh, waste, the high-level nuclear waste from Seabrook and other plants in New England is currently planned to be shipped uh, way far away from here to southern, uh, to, to Texas, to West Texas, way down south and far west. Um, and the, the, uh, the, the thing that many people don't realize from this area that I'm asking people to think about is that there are families and children in West Texas too that we're never responsible for producing uh, nuclear materials, and there's no reason why they should have nuclear waste in their backyard other than the fact that we, American citizens, are allowing this process to take place whereby hundreds and literally thousands of tons of high-level waste is gonna be uh, transported across our country to these places in South Texas without the consent of those who may be affected. And those people that may be affected are all along the transportation routes. These are either gonna be carried by rail or they're gonna be carried by truck. Uh, and they are gonna be affected uh, in the communities where the, or may be affected in the communities where the waste is gonna be stored. Um, they're gonna be in a parking lot type situation what's called consolidated, consolidated Interim Storage, or CIS. And one of the important things to know about Consolidated Interim Storage, for all of us to remember, is that interim is very likely a euphemism. It's very possible that if the waste is actually sent to West Texas and ends up on a parking lot, that all of the people that were responsible for putting it there will pass from this world and it will be left to future generations to decide what to do to this awful mess that we've made just for the sake of generating electricity, which could be done so much more easily uh, in this day and age for reasons that I, and, and for method, in methods that I don't really need to go into. Um, the, the, uh, the one other thing I will mention about that before I go on to what I'm supposed to be talking about is that um, uh, there, there hasn't been any consent Granted, and many of us are aware from the early days of uh, C10 uh, trying to uh, oppose the licensure of Seabrook for all of the reasons that it should never have opened. Uh, what an awful thing it is when something like this is imposed on you without your consent. And so I want you all to know that there's a national movement afoot uh, to uh, get to apply pressure to the federal government so that decisions about the location uh, and, and direction of travel for this uh, high-level nuclear waste will not go forward without the consent of the people involved. And, and, I, and I, I'm telling you all this as a, as a person who is concerned with monitoring. I consider this an integral part of monitoring the nuclear fuel cycle. We need to be paying attention, as we need to be paying attention to decommissioning the may well be coming up for Seabrook more, much more rapidly than we realize. We need to also be looking at what's gonna to happen to the nuclear waste that, that should be kept in our region rather than shipped across the country to communities that have no business being subjected to poisons that were generated in the East. So having said all that, I can tell you that um, as far as uh, the, the current st uh, status of things goes, I think Pat, said a couple of things that, uh, that, that I was also gonna mention, but they, they, require, they, uh, they deserve to be repeated. Um, we have had uh, NRC resident inspectors, uh, quarterly integrated inspection reports, and the ACRS meeting, all pointing to 43 specific sites at Seabrook requiring physical modification uh, in order to achieve safe operation and at least six structures are out of compliance due to ASR damage. Only when recalculating the margin of safety, excuse me, only when, only when mathematically recalc recalculating the margin of safety no longer works. In other words, when, when there's no longer a paper fix available, which is what, of course, the nuclear industry would prefer, then they will, re then they will resort to actual physical modifications. So in some instances, they may be 
recalibrating their equations to try to get things to fit properly in the little boxes that they want everything to stay in that we learned from the, uh, the uh, license amendment uh, opposition uh, that they're trying to do. They're trying to keep their parameters within these little boxes. So uh, they'll do these physical modifications as they need to and only as they need to, 43 of them known. And there's a 10-member team currently assigned to perform these modifications over the course of several months uh, with, of course, no input from the general public. So we are very, very likely not to know what uh, safety-related structures have been impacted or what exactly is being done to uh, remedy them. But I think, you know, uh, Tom Zabo's uh, comment about, you know, putting, uh, uh, putting a, uh, uh, a threaded rod through an already deteriorated piece of concrete to try to hold a corner together may not be the best way. I mean, I, I think if a building inspector was going to check my work, they, that would probably fail. So, I mean, you know, the NRC obviously has a very different standard. Uh, as uh, Professor Sama, Salma, excuse me, pointed out uh, when he was here in 2019 as our expert witness on the ASR hearings, his greatest concern and, and our greatest con concern should be for the um, uh, at the ground impact of ASR on the containment structure at Seabrook. Uh, that if there was uh, serious a deterioration of the concrete uh, at grade level uh, during the uh, event of a high level earthquake, possibly above the design basis that was used to determine the parameters for plant construction, then it is possible, according to Victor, that we could see enough shear take place that could cause um, you know, a catastrophic failure of the containment. And the containment is the thing that keeps radiation uh, within the reactor core away from the general public. And if we were to see such a thing as a result of an earthquake, then we would have a great release, potentially great release of radiation uh, out in the surrounding area, uh, uh, possibly affecting the homes of all of the people that we love and care about in, in, uh, in the area where we live. So, um, because the uh, NRC regulations do not require consideration of worst case seismic events, uh, we can hope that next era and NRC are praying on our behalf that such a worst case event does not take place. Um, we are the ones that are going to be affected and it seems to be that everyone's prayers are all that's gonna be keeping us from having something like that happen. Uh, perhaps we can see better on the part of the NRC and, and uh, the uh, advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards than we've seen so far. I thought it was relevant to point out that, you know, someone uh, just mentioned recently that, that uh, the ACRS has now invited testimony from, you know, uh, experts to try to determine just how uh, alkali silica reaction should be dealt with. And I just want people to realize that in 2018, when we, when C10, had litigation pending before the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board, the Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards, knowing full well that we still had a, a whole case pending as to why the license amendment request was not sufficient, a bunch of people from with this group called AC ACRS who knew nothing about concrete determined that the license amendment request from next year was sufficient that they could grant on the basis of their approval of that license amendment a 20-year extension to the license. That happened before, by six months, we were able to have our day in court with the Atomic Safety and License Board. And there was no reason why they could not have waited until our case was, was brought to court. They were so determined to pass the license extension that they figured out a way to do it that, that, that did an end run around all of the lit, you know, litigation that we had pulled together. And uh, obviously we still won some important concessions, but uh, it's uh, nearly impossible for citizens groups 
uh, to win much that's significant from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and they keep proving that. Uh, and we keep proving that we're not going away. We're all going to keep trying. So I, I just want to thank Diane for showing up today. That was very good of you to come up from down south. Inspirational person for me. And, and thank you to uh, Pat and to all of the other people who are officers of C-10 who were willing to just say, let's do it again. So what are you pointing to? Sorry, Natalie. Okay. Sure, yeah. Advisory board members as well as board of directors, yeah. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so I arranged for these wireless microphones to be here so that if anybody had a question, we could bring them the mic, and the person who answered it could also have a microphone, but I feel like we can all hear each other here. <laughs> um, I've put it out to our YouTube viewers. If you have any questions, now would be the time to please write it in the chat, and I can read it aloud, and um, whoever is most qualified to answer it can, can give an answer. Otherwise, I'll open it up for the floor. Did anybody want to ask um, any questions of anybody who's spoken today or any general questions about C10? So my question is for Diane, because um, she mentioned Holtec's fourth option is to contain the water, and I wondered, well, what does that actually mean? What's right, right. What Holtec said was is that they would keep the water in the torus, that's under the bottom of the reactor, which means they cannot decommission the site because the water would still be there. They couldn't take down the whole building. Um, so actually, I think Holtec, it was a veiled threat to the town of Plymouth that that water would have to stay there for a very long time, and they wouldn't be able to decommission the site. And, and what about the rods that are there? I mean, the they're all in dry casks. Right. Um, and they're right along a busy road. You can see them from the road. And there's a little bit, I'm like, you only need a few picnic tables to make it more inviting. <laughs> you can see them from the road. And in the Attorney General's agreement, they agreed they would plant shrubbery around the fence so nobody would see it. So I was at a meeting and I said, Excuse me, can you shoot through shrubbery? And Holtec said, yes. I'm like, what the heck, you know? So um, we're on it, but it's, it's outrageous. And you have the same thing here at Seabrook. I just took a little ride. Can I take another minute? Yeah, come on up. OK, thank you. I just took a little ride. I've never been up here before. And I never went to Seabrook. And I went through the town. I thought, well, well, I have some time. So I, drew, I had it on my GPS. And it said, go down Route 107 between two malls. So I'm like, wow, this is interesting. But there's a fence. I'm like, well, this looks funny, all this. There were no like big signs out like around Plymouth, trespassing, armed guards, you know, all of that is around Plymouth. I drove right in and passed that, it looks like an outhouse, but it's really an old guard gate. And um, I'm like, wow. Then I got to a little, a little intersection. I was going to take a right and I'm like, whoa, there's the dome. You can see the dome. So I got out my camera to take a picture of it. And as I'm looking in the, in the picture, out of the corner, I see the dry casks where they keep the waste, right there. Right there. You are, you're worse off than Pilgrim. At least we have like a little grassy area in front of us. That's right along the fence. It's open. And we know that nuclear, nuclear sites are act, uh, um, part of war now. We saw this in Ukraine. And that this level of security around nuclear sites across the country leaves us all very vulnerable. I know at Pilgrim, each canister holds half the seas and released at um, Chernobyl, and there's 64 cans there. And if anything happened to those, I, we're gone. It will be uninhabitable. So that's something everybody needs to pay attention to. My, my other question is for Chris. Um, Chris mentioned that um, the, the waste uh, rods are planned to be shipped to West Texas. Um, 
When you say plan to be shipped, has it been formally agreed that they're to be shipped, or is that just like Holtec has plans to discharge water, but it's not actually been formally agreed yet? Or and you said it does. You talked about consent, you know, and well, there could be consent, but maybe they can bypass consent. So, wh what is the actual status of the plan, and at what level is it kind of perhaps, you know, moving towards some agreement? Or great questions. The issue of consent is a snarly one for all of us because. These are federally licensed facilities, so state laws don't necessarily apply. They can always say, well, no, we're federal, so you know, get out of our way. Um, that does not mean that people should not organize uh, and, and do our best to uh, use the, the three-legged stool system that we have learned very well over uh, recent years, where we, you know, we use the press, we use our political representatives and we use our base of support to try to you know, ensure that the things that we know must happen actually do happen. And so it is possible that we can organize all along the transportation routes. And this work is actually being done right now on a national level to try to get everyone together that there has to be consent. There has to be consent-based siting for the kinds of facilities they're talking about in West Texas. But to get to the heart of your question, they are actually prohibited by their own federal statutes, with they, which they seem to be willing to go against, to, to set up a consolidated interim storage facility without having first put the permanent repository in place. Without the Yucca Mountain facility having been licensed and opened, there is no permanent repository in place. Therefore, according to the National Environmental Protection Act, they should not be setting up consolidated interim storage anywhere for the reason that I expressed before. We don't know that it's going to be interim. You know, unless and until we have a permanent repository, all of that should be stopped. But in the meantime, they're trying their best to go ahead with it. They'd like to use a loophole. I understand that, that in the case, for instance, of the WIP project in New Mexico, waste isolation pilot project, they've talked about adding a second under, underground burial grid near the original one. And because it would be an addition, they're saying, therefore, they don't have to apply for a new license. And that it would not then um, contradict the law you know, uh, uh, within NEPA. Uh, and this is just a way for them to get around, you know, they, they're just finding a way to get around their own laws in order to make what they want to have happen, happen. There is no repository, and it shouldn't be moved to, a cons to an interim site until there is a repository by their, own, by their own laws. They should be made to stick to it. And, and citizens all over the country are, are beginning to get together to try to ensure from their own regions that that is prevented both in the uh, use of publicity and, and, the, and the use of our policymakers. But isn't also the default that that isn't to happen? The default is that every nuclear power plant has to keep their casks of all these rods for perpetuity and has to kind of keep monitoring them for the next 25,000 years, et cetera. The, well, the, the, you know, I know there are other people that are probably want to speak, but I'll just say this, which is that uh, the uh, the people that created the stuff own the stuff unless and until the Department of Energy takes possession of it. Once the DOE takes possession of it, then it's out of the hands of the owners and they can so-called wash their hands of it. And that's one reason why everybody is so interested in having it shipped right away, because the sooner the owners can get rid of the, their high-level waste, then the waste that they spend years generating and making money off of becomes the liability of the American public. It's no longer their liability. Just a reminder when people are speaking to speak right into the mic and if you can identify yourself if you haven't spoken yet, that'll be good for the viewers at home. Thanks, Diane. I was just wondering if I could just add what's happening at Pilgrim because we're, we're your future, you know? So <laughs> pay attention to what we're doing here. But what's happening with Coltec is um, first of all, the decommissioning trust fund, which your uh, next era and energy will use, 
to transfer the waste out of the pool and into the dry casks. Well, when they do that, they, they've been taking the decommissioning trust fund money. The uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission gave Holtec an exemption. It was never meant to use, be used for that, but our decommissioning trust fund money, which is ratepayer money that they collected um, before deregulation, um, is being used now for spent fuel. And then Holtec sues the DOE because they never upheld their promise to take the waste in 1999. So, the, so Holtec sues DOE, gets the money from the waste that they are storing, and then they take it from the decommissioning trust fund and put it in their pocket. They're double dipping, and that's what's gonna happen here too. And about the waste, Holtec is trying to build a centralized interim storage in New Mexico, and talking about consent, the state of New Mexico has a lawsuit against the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for licensing that, and has named Holtec for misrepresentation, illegal activities. The people in New Mexico have said, no, we don't want your garbage. And Holtec is pushing forward with the total support of the NRC. On the flip side, the NRC says the waste is gonna stay at Pilgrim. It could be up to 100 years. So we're looking for, and I'll wrap it up. What do you need? We need thick-walled casks that can be monitored for pressure. And we need hot cells at each reactor site, so if there is a problem, they can take that damaged re uh, canister, put it in a building, transfer it, and then put it back out wherever. But it's gotta be in a building, a climate-controlled building, with real security. That's what they do in Switzerland, and we can do it here, but the nuclear industry, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission isn't gonna force any of these companies to spend the money to do the right thing. That's, what, that's our job, unfortunately. Hey, Diane Turco, would you mind going up to join our director, Sarah, at the front so that I know there's going to be a lot of questions for you so you can be on camera because I don't think that you are now. You want to give that in? Thanks. Tag team it together. Oh. You might have questions, too. Go away. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions from the group? Dan, I was curious, yes. um, that initiative that you took to get uh, the issue on the ballot in all of those towns, it sounds like something that I, I put in our back pocket for here, and now I need to look at New Hampshire, um, if that, the, the EPZ towns, if that's a similar process. I don't know the New Hampshire laws, but we do have a state law in Massachusetts that it's 10 signatures um, some town clerks aren't familiar with it, so I can give you the number, um, but it's a state law um, in Massachusetts. And it's really easy and it's a great way to get the conversation going and get information out for people to talk about the issues. Um, so we, we use it as a great educational tool. Because you know, as director of Cape Down Windows, our, my responsibility, we um, investigate, educate, and then agi agitate. And so that's our education. I would recommend, I highly recommend it for any organization, yeah. Okay. I don't have any questions from the viewers online, so I think I'll come up. Well, thank you, Diane, you did. Double, triple duty there. <laughs> you spoke, you answered a few questions, you really uh, made most of your visit with us. So thank you so much. And to our board members who spoke, and to all of our board members and our advisory board members, um, and all of our business allies, there's a slide in here giving thanks to all of them. Um, I would probably run over time if, if I thanked every single one because we are tremendously uh, appreciative and, and lucky to have so many supporters. Um, and I personally feel tremendously lucky to have found this organization. I'm so thrilled um, as a mother of a small kiddo and kind of making my first home here in Stratum, well, here in the EPZ. Uh, this is something that's very personal, and I think a lot of people in this room feel that way. Chris, you painted a very uh, compelling picture of people wanting to protect their families, um, whether that be the NIMBY, you know, get the stuff out of here, or the innocent people who never um, you know, had anything to do with the cycle of nuclear waste production. Um, so that, that hit home with me and, and all of the 
uh, historical knowledge that I'm absorbing from everyone, all the institutional knowledge, I'm going to really try to use that as a tool to be an effective executive director, and I look forward to all of the things that are in our future. So thank you. I guess I will close the meeting with my hand gavels, and we have some cookies and some water, and we can mingle for a few minutes of, um, at the front if uh, everybody wants to do that.